Hello everyone. Uh, so today we're doing something a little different. There's no video on YouTube just because it's been kind of a difficult week with my um, mental and physical health. So I'm just not a hundred percent, although I think I'm starting to um, recover. So, and also it's the first week of class, but last week was my busiest day because, or my busiest week because I am co-chair I, I am the scheduler at my community college, and so I'm trying to figure out which instructors can teach classes that no one really wants to teach because of the time or the day. Um, and like every other college and university, I feel as if we need to hire more people. So if you're in the Colorado area, and no, I, I can't hire you. So... Um, but, you know, we might be putting out a call. So I still wanted to have a video up by Wednesday, so this is the best I can do. I'm so sorry if you miss my face. Just kidding. I know you don't. Um, all right. And if you're listening on my podcast, then there's no change for you. All right. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to read um, a selection from Karl Marx in his The Limits of the Working Day from Das Kapital in, well, volume one, 1867. And I might, I might read the commentary afterwards because there are some added quotes and I think it's really interesting. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what we, what we get there. All right. So this is entitled in this book and it is uh, this book that I'm reading from is How to Read Marx. The um, person that is giving the commentary, which I might or might not read, is Peter Osborne. And it's a part of the Simon Kreitley How to Read series, which I've read quite a few of. There are different professors that write uh, on the various uh, philosophers. Um, if you're looking for a more sort of comprehensive like reader, I would suggest the Marx Engels reader. I have the second edition. It's edited by Robert C. Tucker, and it's a it's a pretty good volume. It has it has pretty much everything I think you'd want. But um, that's not what I'm reading from today. All right, let's get started. And I'll just ask this question. Um, have you ever felt as if you would want the work week to be structured differently? Um, whether that be the number of hours that you work in a day or the number of days you are required to work in a week or the pressures and demands for you to work at a certain pace and level of efficiency within that time period. Because those are the questions that Marx is dealing with in this context, although, you know, he's writing in the 19th century. So situations were um, much more dire back then. Um, they had, a, he's really talking about a 12-hour work week, trying to um, suggest and argue for a nine-hour work week. And in that time, they weren't worried so much about things that we are, such as burnout or um, work-life balance, but they it was really more of, uh, you know, having safe conditions to work, not being in danger for your health, your life, um, your well-being in a more um, intense and extreme way. The capitalist has brought the labor power at its daily value. The use value of the labor power belongs to him throughout one working day. He has thus acquired the right to make the worker work for him during one day. So basically, it is day increments. Um, and then Marx asks, what is a working day? At all events, it is less than a natural day. So that makes sense, right? Um, we can't work for 24 hours, right? We have to sleep. We have to have some time to eat. We have to have some time to do the basic necessities or 
the capitalist in this case will um, not have a worker, not have labor power because the worker will not be alive for a month, for very long. So how much less is it than the natural day? The capitalist has his own view of this point of no return. So how much is too much to ask or demand or require? The, ne the necessary limit of the working day. As a capitalist, he is only capital personified. His soul is the soul of capital. The capital has one single life force, the drive to valorize itself, to create surplus value, to make its constant part the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus labor. So basically, Marx is going to set up an argument that it's not only that the number of hours that the capitalist makes the worker work or creates for the working day, that's not the only avenue because, because Marx will say that capital is vampire-like. It, it will find a way, it will find a path to take more out of, out of you, out of the worker. Capital is dead labor, which, vampire-like, lives only by sucking living labor and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. The time during which the worker works is the time during which the capitalist consumes the labor power he has bought from him. If the worker consumes his disposable time for himself, he robs the capitalist. And I think this mindset and mentality is is still apparent in certain workplaces. For instance, if you've ever had the experience where, you know, your manager, your boss kind of sees you chatting and says, hey, there's something to do. Um, don't just sit around. Why aren't you working? So the, you know, that implies that you should be working constantly. If you are in that building, then you can't take a time, can't take time to chat with someone, to hang out, to take a breather. You always have to be busy or else you're, you're doing something immoral. You are stealing. You are being a thief. You're, you know, getting one under the boss. The capitalist therefore takes his stand on the law of commodity exchange. Like all other buyers, he seeks to extract the maximum possible benefit from the use value of his commodity. Suddenly, however, there arises the voice of the worker, which had previously been stifled in the sound and fury of the production process. So now here you have the plea, the plea of the worker, speaking to the capitalist, trying to help them see that they need not demand so many hours in the day that they shouldn't. The commodity I have sold you differs from the ordinary crowd of commodities in that its use creates value, a greater value than it costs. So basically it seems like he's saying, you know, you can't just look at the literal numbers, the hours that I'm working, look at what the value really is of what I'm doing for you and admit that and be fair about it. So I think that this, you know, police could still be in use today, let's say in any sort of retail uh, or any business really. Um, you know, the, the retail worker, uh, you know, serving burgers at McDonald's can say, well, without us, you don't have a McDonald's. So why is the CEO with all the surplus and all the value that we are creating, that our commodity is worth, why is this, the CEO is profiting um, to an exorbitant degree and it's not a fair exchange? And actually, Marx will say that any profit, any... Um, any profit that someone makes is the, or the more profit that someone makes, the more they exploit their workers. So, um, you know, the level of exploitation, the level of inequality is something that I still think matters today, right? I mean, it's the, 
I don't want to get personal, um, but it's hard not to, even in, let's say, um, colleges and universities, there are part-time instructors, even, you know, full-time instructors, uh, don't always make a living wage. Um, and, you know, where would the, where would the college and the university be without the faculty? Where would they be without the students? Um, and it, it affects the students, um, if their instructors aren't being paid, um, a great deal because, or this is probably even more, um, you know, more emphatic in like K through 12 when we're talking about what we pay teachers in K through 12 in the States, you know, if your instructor, whether it's a part-time college instructor or a full-time college instructor or a K through 12 teacher, um, has to get another job, has to find a side job, um, just to make ends meet, to, you know, to live the life that they need to or want to, then how is that going to affect the student, right? How is it going to affect the student if we raise the, um, minimum on all the, the classes and require, you know, that all, and, and also raise the cap. So there can be 30 students in a class. There can be 20 students in a class. We're no longer, um, advertising a ratio. So, you know, I mean, I think that many people can relate this to their specific situation. That is why you bought it. What appears on your side as the valorization of capital is on my side an excess expenditure of labor power. You and I know in the marketplace only one law, that of the exchange of commodities. And the consumption of the commodity belongs not to the seller who parts to it, parts with it, but to the buyer who acquires it. The use of my daily power therefore belongs to you. But by means of the price you pay for it every day, I must be able to reproduce it every day. So this is, this is really the first sort of major argument here. How can we be able to give you what you want, capitalist, if you're taking more than we actually have, more than we can actually, more time and more effort than... Uh, we actually have to replenish that to give back to you. So it's kind of like speaking to the audience this worker is doing. It, that's, yeah. Okay, sorry, the grammar on that was, that sentence was atrocious. All right, apart from the natural deterioration through age, etc., I must be able to work tomorrow with the same normal amount of strength, health, and freshness of today. So really, we are kind of getting into burnout, except... In Marx's time, it was, it was like life or death burnout. Um, and it isn't always, I think, in our time, depending where you are. But sometimes it is. It's a big world. You are constantly preaching to me the gospel of saving and abstinence. So I love that because, you know, then you can ask, well, what do our bosses and managers, those who are higher up, what do they say to us when we you know, start to complain and get disgruntled about what we're paid and what we're meant, what we're asked to do, um, you know, what sort of, how do they sort of brush off their own responsibility and lay it on the worker? You know, you just need to budget better. You just need to save. You should have invested. Um, it's your, it's your problem, not the problem of this institution or this business, um, we pay you what you're worth, a competitive price, or maybe just the price that we can. Um, and you have to deal with the rest. Very well. Like a sensible, thrifty owner of property, I will husband my soul wealth, my labor power, and abstain from wasting it foolishly. Every day I will spend, set in motion, transfer into labor only as much of it as is compatible with its normal duration and healthy development. By an unlimited extension of the working day, you may in one day use up a quantity of labor power greater than I can restore in three. 
And, you know, how many times have I heard people or my friends say that, you know, the weekend isn't enough? Um, you know, we need a four day weekend or in some jobs when, you know, for people who are bringing their work home because it doesn't just end, you know, when they move from the office to their house, sometimes you're using one day of your weekend to um, prepare for that, for that job and still do some work. Um, you know, but even if not, even if you don't take your work home and you have Saturday and Sunday, a lot of times, um, you know, I've heard people say that, oh, well, Saturday is just my day to really like, I just can't do anything. I really have to take care of myself and rest. And then Sunday is my, would be my day for just doing my hobbies and like, you know, whatever pleases me. But then I'm so stressed out because I'm thinking about having to get up for work the next day. Um, so yeah. So I thought that was interesting. What you gain in labor, I lose in the substance of labor. Using my labor and despoiling it are quite different things. You may be a model citizen, perhaps a member of the RSPCA, and you may be in the odor of, odor of sanctity as well. But the thing you represent when you come face to face with me has no heart in its breast. What seems to throb there is my own heartbeat. I demand a normal working day because, like every other seller, I demand the value of my commodity. So what is something really worth? You know, and this gets into, I think, the whole conversation of, let's say, fast fashion. You know, it's, uh, is it great if the consumer can buy, you know, a a t-shirt for two dollars but thinking about the material and the hours put into that and you know the people the work that's outsourced probably and not paid very well what is that actually worth what should we be paying for it and is the is the payment going into the right places there is here therefore an antinom an antinomy I don't know how to say that, of right against right. So it's like we both, we both want something, right? The CEO and the, the worker at McDonald's. Both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchange between equal rights, force decides. Hence, in the history of capitalist production, the establishment of a norm for the working day presents itself as a struggle over the limits of that day. A struggle between collective capital, i.e. the class of capitalists, and collective labor, i.e. the working class. Okay, so now I'm going to um, read a little bit of the commentary because there's another quote from Das Kapital um, soon after. All right, so this is Peter Osborne. The Communist Manifesto presents the bourgeoisie as the subject, the principle of activity of capitalism, and the proletariat as the subject of communism. In Capital, on the other hand, two decades later, Marx methodologically reduced the bourgeois, the capitalist, to capital personified, and the proletariat to labor. It is as if he had retrospectively acknowledged the allegorical character of the manifesto's narrative. As he explained in the preface to the first edition of Capital, Volume 1, 1867, individuals are dealt with here only in so far as they are the personifications of economic categories, the bearers of particular class relations and interests. My standpoint from which the economic formation of society is viewed as a process of natural history can less than any other make the individual responsible for relations whose creature she remains, socially speaking, however much she may subjectively raise herself above them. So that was Marx. Back to Peter Osborne. Far from the bourgeois class being the source of historical action, it is now viewed as no more than human support, a processes that display the logic of a system. The subject, the principle of activity of this system is capital itself. 
Capital is understood by Marx and Capital as a particular form of value, self-expanding value, grounded in the commodity, which is the elementary form of value. As such, it is not a merely physical thing, means of production, but is itself a social relation. Social relations constitute wealth as capital. Capital expands by entering into relations with other commodities. In production, the value of capital expands as it absorbs surplus labor. Labor it extracts from the worker, which is over and above the value of the worker's labor power. Capital absorbs surplus labor by purchasing labor power as a commodity and putting it to work as variable capital, that portion of capital that has the ability to create value. Capital thus appears to have a life force of its own, the drive to valorize itself, to create surplus value, to make its constant part, the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus value. So I wonder if this is also kind of an argument for changing systems, you know, because one, um, one approach might be to ask, can we do capitalist in a more ethical, fair way that is truly more beneficial to, um, those who are the life force of businesses who are creating the value, Um, You know, do we need to live in a capitalism and practice capitalism in the way that there's no limit to, sorry, is there noise in the hallway? Um, There's no limit to what you can make, you know? So, oh, you, you deserve that. You, you know, worked really hard. You worked really smart. And so you deserve you know, having $20 million to put down on a house and to buy a second and third house. You deserve to have the fanciest cars. Even if other people are living paycheck to paycheck, that inequality only motivates people, right? Is there, I mean, we could put limits on that in a sense. Um, But, you know, and in Marx, there are stages of capitalism, but they all lead to sort of a new communism that is harkens back to maybe a, a more original one in the past, but is, uh, you know, what the, the modern person can practice and endure. All right, so I think I'll go ahead and stop there. It's kind of a short um, lecture, but I hope that that was interesting and helpful. Um, I'm really excited about getting back into the actual mark angles reader i'm gonna um go ahead and add it to my list of books that i'm reading i haven't been reading very much this past week just because i had an eye injury and i just i don't know sometimes when i don't feel well i feel depressed and so um you know i have i have a problem with catastrophizing is that what it's called think so um anyway but i hope that you are better than i am i'm not too bad and um if you had started back to school it is august 30th where i am this podcast and video will go out on the 31st so i just wish all of my own college students well and um all of the college students out there or just you know the independent scholars or the people interested in philosophy If you have your favorite quote by Marx or if you have a suggestion of what I should, um, of what I should read first, um, of Marx, because I'm just rereading even the things that I've read in the past, let me know and why. And I look forward to feeling better and having a video in the future. Thank you.